Hey crew, it's Pitt and I am back with some more Esoterica. Today we are diving back into the works of Manly Hall. We are talking about the secret teachings of all ages. We are in part three, which is the third and final part of the Masonic symbology. We are reading through and discussing as we go along, and that's not for everybody. And if it's not for you, that is perfectly understandable. If you get lost, if you would like to know more about what I do here, some of the unconventional beliefs that I hold, they will be linked in the corner up here. I will reference those links many times because most of the things that you have questions about will be explained in these various playlists. With that being said, let's dive in and see what Mr. Hall has to say about the Ancient Mysteries and Secret Societies, Part 3. The most famous of the ancient religions mysteries were the Eleusinian, whose rites were celebrated every five years in the city of Eleusius to honor Ceres. Demeter, Rhea, or Isis, and her daughter, Persephone. The initiates of the Eleusian, Eleusinian school were famous throughout Greece for the beauty of their philosophic concepts and the high standards of morality which they had demonstrated in their daily lives. Because of their excellence, these mysteries spread to Rome and Britain, and later the initiations were given in both of these countries. The Eleusinian Mysteries, named for the community in Attica where the sacred dramas were first presented, are generally believed to have been founded by Eumpolos, Eum, Eumolopos, about 1400 years before the birth of Christ, and through the Platonic system of philosophy, their principles have been preserved to modern times. The rites of Eleusius, with their mystic interpretation of nature's most precious secrets, overshadowed the civilizations of their time and gradually absorbed many smaller schools, incorporating into their own system whatever valuable information these lesser institutions possessed. Hecate Thorne sees in the mysteries of Ceres and Bacchus a metamorphosis of the rites of Isis and Osiris, and there is every reason to believe that all the, all, all the so-called secret schools of the ancient world were branches from one philosophic tree, which, with its root in heaven and its branches on the earth, is, like the spirit of man, an invisible but ever-present cause of objectified vehicles that give it expression. The mysteries were the channels through which this one philosophic light was disseminated, and their initiates, resplendent with intellectual and spiritual understanding, were the perfect fruitage of the divine tree bearing witness before the material world of the recondrite source of all light and truth. The rites of Eleusius were divided into what are were called the lesser and greater mysteries. According to James Gardner, the lesser mysteries were celebrated in the spring, probably at the time of the vernal equinox, in the town of Agre, and the greater in the fall, the time of the autumnal equinox, at Eleusis or Athens. It is supposed that the former were given annually and the latter every five years. The rituals of the Eleusinians were highly involved and to understand them required a deep study of Greek mythology, which they interpreted in its esoteric light with the aid of their secret keys. <clears throat> the lesser mysteries were dedicated to Persephone. In his Eleusinian and Bacchic Mysteries, Thomas Taylor sums up their purpose as follows. The lesser mysteries were designed by the ancient theologists, their founders, to signify, occultly, the condition of the unpurified soul invested with an earthly body and enveloped in a material and physical nature. The legend used in the lesser rites is that of the abduction of the goddess Persephone, the daughter of Ceres, by Pluto, the lord of the underworld, or Hades. While Persephone is picking flowers in a beautiful meadow, the earth suddenly opens, and the gloomy lord of death, riding a magnificent chariot, emerges from its somber depths, and grasping her in his arms, carries the screaming and struggling goddess into his subterranean palace, where he forces her to become his queen. It is doubtful whether many of the initiates themselves understood the mystic meaning of this allegory, for most of them apparently believed that it referred solely to the succession of the seasons. It is difficult to obtain satisfactory information concerning the mysteries, for the candidates were bound by inviolable oaths never to reveal their inner secrets 
to the profane. At the beginning of the ceremony of initiation, the candidates stood up upon the skins of animals sacrificed for the purpose and vowed that death should seal his lips before he would divulge the sacred truths which were about to be communicated to him. Through indirect channels, however, some of the secrets have been preserved. The teachings given to the neophytes were substantially as follows. The soul of man, often called psyche, and in the Eleusinian mysteries symbolized by Persephone, is essentially a spiritual thing. Its true home is in the higher worlds, where, free from the bondage of material form and material concepts, it is said to be truly alive and self-expressive. The human, or physical nature of man, according to this doctrine, is a tomb, a quagmire of false and impermanent things, the source of all sorrow and suffering. Plato describes the body as the sepulchre of the soul, and by this he means not only the human form, but also the human nature. The gloom and depression of the lesser mysteries represented the agony of the spiritual soul, unable to express itself because it has accepted the limitations and illusions of the human environment. The crux of the Eleusinian argument was that man is neither better nor wiser after death than during life. If he does not rise above ignorance during his sojourn here, man goes at death into eternity to wander about forever, making the same mistakes which he made here. If he does not outgrow the desire for material possessions here, he will carry it with him into the invisible world, where, because he can never gratify the desire, he will continue in endless agony. Dante's Inferno is symbolically descriptive of the sufferings of those who have never freed their spiritual natures from the cravings, habits, viewpoints, and limitations of their plutonic personalities, those who made no endeavor to improve themselves, whose souls have slept during their physical lives, passed into death, at death, into Hades, where lying in rows they slept through all eternity as they had slept through life. I did the journey for Dante's Inferno. It is part of the pig cast on oh, no, its ancient lore playlist it will be linked um, we're going to talk real briefly about the trinity because it has come up again and it is in part what they are implying here right you have the body which is the physical prison don't like that terminology at all because we are not in a prison we are here voluntarily for the experience and you have the ego which is symbolized by persephone here but it is the same everywhere, right? You have the body, you have the soul, which is the decider, and you have the spirit, which is the fire that is the becoming. It is the, the third part of the Trinity is time in motion. Right? You have the body, you have the decider, and you have the thing that helps the, the, the decisions to come into being. That's the Trinity, and that's what's being implied here. Even though they did not list the third part of the Trinity in any meaningful manner. To the Eleusinian philosophers, birch in the into the birch into the physical world was death in the fullest sense of the world. I am sure that means birth and not birch, because I don't know why tree into the physical world would be a thing. And the only true birth was that of the spiritual soul of man rising out of the womb of his own fleshly nature. The soul is dead that slumbers, says Longfellow, and in, in this he strikes the keynote of the Eleusinian mysteries. Just as Narcissus, gazing at himself in the water, the ancients used this mobile element to symbolize the transitory, illusionary material universe, lost his life trying to embrace a reflection. So man, gazing into the mirror of nature and accepting as his real self the senseless clay that he sees reflected, loses the opportunity afforded by physical life to unfold his immortal, invisible self. An ancient initiate once said that the living are ruled by the dead. Only those conversant with the Eleusinian concept of life could understand that statement. It means that the majority of people are not ruled by their living spirits, but by their senseless, hence dead, animal personalities. Transmigration and reincarnation were taught in these mysteries, but in a somewhat unusual manner. It was believed that at midnight, the invisible worlds were closest to the terrestrial sphere and that souls coming into material existence slip in during the midnight hour. For this reason, many of the Eleusinian ceremonies were performed at midnight, 
some of those sleeping spirits who had failed to awaken their higher natures during the earth life and who now floated around in invisible worlds surrounded by a darkness of their own making occasionally slipped through at this hour and assumed the forms of various creatures. All right, this is the Assault of Persephone. I'm not going to say that word. From Thomason's Requiem de Figures, Groups, Themes, Fountains, Vases, and Etruts Ornamente. Pluto, the lord of the underworld, represents the body intelligence of man, and the assault of the Persephone is a symbolic of the divine nature, assaulted and defiled by the animal soul, and dragged downward into the somber darkness of Hades, which is here used as a synonym for the material or objective sphere of consciousness. In his Disquisitions upon the Painted Greek Vases, James Christie presents Marusius' version of the occurrence taking place during the nine days required for the enactment of the greater Eleusinian rites. The first day was that of the general meeting, during which those to be initiated were questioned concerning their several qualifications. The second day was spent in a procession to the sea, possibly for the submerging of an image of the presiding goddess. goddess. The third day was opened by the sacrifice of a mullet. On, that's not a hairstyle, it's a bird. On the fourth day, the mystic basket containing sa certain sacred symbols was brought to Eleusis, accompanied by a number of female devotees carrying smaller baskets. On the evening of the fifth day, there was a torch race, and on the sixth day, a procession led by the statue of Bacchus, and the seventh, an athletic contest. The eighth day was devoted to a repetition of the ceremonial for the benefit of any who have, might have been prevented from coming sooner. The ninth and last day was devoted to the deepest philosophical issues of the Eleusinia, during which an urn or jar, the symbol of Bacchus, was exhibited as an emblem of supreme importance. The mystics of Eleusius also laid stress upon the evil of suicide explaining that there was a profound mystery concerning this crime of which they could not speak, but warning their disciples that a great sorrow comes to all who take their own lives. This, in substance, constitutes the esoteric doctrine given to the initiates of the lesser mysteries. As the degree dealt largely with the miseries of those who failed to make the best use of their philosophic opportunities, the chambers of initiation were subterranean, and the horrors of Hades were vividly depicted in a complicated ritualistic drama. After passing successfully through the torturous passageways with their trials and dangers, the candidate received the honorary title of Mystis. This meant that one who saw through a veil or had a clouded vision. It also signified that the candidate had been brought up to the veil, which would be torn away in the higher degree. The word mystic, as referring to a seeker after truth according to the dictates of the heart along the path of faith, is probably derived from this ancient word, for faith is belief in the reality of things unseen or veiled. The greater mysteries, into which the candidate was admitted only after he has successfully passed through the less ordeals of the lesser, and not always then, were sacred to Ceres, the mother of Persephone, and represent her as a wandering through the world in conquest of her abducted daughter. Ceres carried two torches, intuition and reason, to aid her in the search for her lost child, the soul. At last she found Persephone not far from Eleusis, and out of gratitude taught the people there to cultivate corn, which is sacred to her. She also founded the mysteries. Ceres appeared before Pluto, god of the souls of the dead, and pleaded with him to allow Persephone to return to her home. This the god at first refused to do because Persephone had eaten of the pomegranate, the fruit of mortality. At last, however, he compromised and agreed to per permit Persephone to live in the upper world half of the year if she would stay with him in the darkness of Hades for the remaining half. And I want to point something out here because I am fairly positive. Let me go ahead and pop that back over. I am fairly positive that this cannot be. I am by no means an expert, but I am fairly sure that there was no corn in Europe until after the discovery of the New World, right? I am fairly positive that that was something that was cultivated on this continent, not that continent. I could be wrong. 
If I am, y'all let me know down below because I don't like to be wrong and I'm not going to go and Google it. But I'm pretty sure that corn was a North American product and that we imported it over there and not the other way around. So this is incorrect if that is true. <clears throat> they could be a been taught to cultivate weed that's that's common over there barley that's common over there but not not corn i don't i'm pretty sure corn was not less like potatoes potatoes wasn't around then either so the greeks believed that persephone was a manifestation of the solar energy which in the winter months lived under the earth with pluto but in the summer returned again with the goddess of productiveness there is a legend that the flowers love Persephone and that every year when she left for the dark realms of Pluto, the plants and shrubs would die of grief. While the profane and uninitiated had their own opinions on these subjects, the truths of the Greek allegories remained safely concealed by the priests, who alone recognized the sublimity of these great philosophic and religious parables. Thomas Taylor epitomizes the doctrines of the greater mysteries in the following statement. The greater mysteries, obscured and obscurely intimated by mystic and splendid visions. The felicity of the soul, both here and hereafter, when purified from the defilement of a material nature and constantly elevated to the re realities of intellectual, spiritual vision. Just as the lesser mysteries discuss, discussed in the prenatal epoch of man, when the consciousness in its nine days, embryologically nine months, was descending into the realm of illusion and assuming the veil of unreality. So the greater mysteries discussed the principles of spiritual regeneration and revealed to initiates not only the simplest, but also the most direct and complete method of liberating their highest natures from the bondage of material ignorance. Like Prometheus chained to the mount, top of Mount Caucasus, man's higher nature is chained to his inadequate personality. The nine days of initiation were also symbolic of the nine spheres through which the human soul descended during the process of assuming a terrestrial form. The secret exercises for spiritual unfoldment given to disciples of the higher degrees are unknown, but there is every reason to believe that they were similar to the Brahmanic mysteries, since it is known that the Eleusinian ceremonies were closed with the Sanskrit words, Konks Om Pax. That part of the allegory referring to the two six-month periods during one of which Persephone must remain with Pluto, while during the other she may revisit the upper world, offers material for deep consideration. It is probable that the Eleusinians realized that the soul left the body during sleep, or at the least was made capable of leaving by the special training which undoubtedly they were in a position to give. Thus, Persephone would remain as the queen of Pluto's realm during the waking hours, but would ascend to the spiritual worlds during the periods of sleep. The initiate was taught how to intercede with Pluto to permit Persephone, the initiate's soul, to ascend from the darkness of his material nature into the light of understanding. When thus freed from the shackles of clay and crystallized concepts, the initiate was liberated, not only for the period of his life, but for all eternity, for never thereafter was he divested of those soul qualities which, after death, were his vehicles for manifestation and expression in the so-called heaven world. In contrast to the idea of Hades as a state of darkness below, the gods were said to inhabit the tops of mountains, a well-known example being Mount Olympus, where the twelve deities of the Greek pantheon were said to dwell together. In his initiatory wanderings, the neophyte therefore entered chambers of ever-increasing brilliancy to portray the ascent of the spirit from the lower worlds into the realm of bliss. As the climax to such wanderings, he entered a great vaulted room, in the center of which stood a brilliantly illumined, illumined statue to the goddess Ceres. Here, in the presence of the Hierophant, and surrounded by priests in magnificent robes, he was instructed in the highest of the secret mysteries of Eleusis. At the conclusion of this ceremony, he was hailed as an epoptis, which meant one who has been has beheld or seen directly. For this reason, also initiation was termed autopsy. 
the Apoptes was then given certain sacred books, probably written in cipher, together with tablets of stone on which secret instructions were engraved. In the obelisk in Freemasonry, John A. Weiss describes the officiating personages as, of the Eleusinian Mysteries as consisting of a male and a female hierophant who directed the initiations. A male and a female torchbearer, a male herald, and a male and female altar attendant. There were also numerous minor officials. He states, according to Porphyry, the Hierophant represents Plato's Demiurgus, or the creator of the world, the torchbearer, the sun, the altar man, the moon, the herald Hermes, or Mercury, and the other officials, minor stars. From the records available, a number of strange and apparently supernatural phenomena accompanied the rituals. Many initiates claimed to have actually seen the living gods themselves. Whether this was the result of religious ecstasy or the actual cooperation of invisible powers with the visible priests must remain a mystery. In The Metamorphosis, or Golden Ass, Apuleius thus describes what in all probability in his initiation into the Eleusinian mysteries. I approached to the confines of death, and having trod on the threshold of Proserpine, I returned from it, being carried through all the elements. At midnight I saw the sun shining with a splendid light, and I manifestly drew near to the gods beneath and the gods above, and proximately adored them. Women and children were admitted into the Eleusinian Mysteries, and at one time there were literally thousands of initiates. Because this vast host was not prepared for the highest spiritual and mystical doctrines, a division necessarily took place within the society itself. The higher teachings were given only to a limited number of initiates, who, because of a superior mentality, showed a comprehensive grasp of their underlying philosophical concepts. Socrates refused to be initiated into the Eleusinian Mysteries, for knowing its principles without being a member of the order, he realized that membership would seal his tongue. That the mysteries of Eleusis were based upon great and eternal truths is attested by the veneration in which they were held by the great minds of the ancient world. M. Overolf asked, would Pindar, Plato, Cicero, Epictetus have spoken of them with such admiration if the Hierophant had satisfied himself with loudly proclaiming his own opinions or those of his order? The garments in which the candidates were initiated were preserved for many years and were believed to possess almost sacred properties. Just as the soul can have no covering save wisdom and virtue, so the candidates, being as yet without true knowledge, were presented to the mysteries unclothed, being first given the skin of an animal and later a consecrated robe to symbolize the philosophical teachings received by the initiate. During the course of initiation, the candidate passed through two gates. The first led downward into the lower worlds and symbolized his birth into ignorance. The second led upward, into a room brilliantly lighted by unseen lamps, into which was the statue of Ceres, and which symbolized the upper world, or the abode of truth and light. Strabo states that the great temple of Eleusis would hold between twenty and thirty thousand people. The caves dedicated by Zarathustra also had these two doors, symbolizing the avenues of birth and death. And this is the processional of Bacchic rites. We have a lot of symbology here, right? There's hounds over here to the right, and there's man-beast here to the left, and there's somebody being pulled along with an angel blowing a trumpet ahead, and there's women with brass bared and adorating, adoring crowds. So, in the initiation of the Bacchonic Mysteries, the role of Bacchus is played by the candidate who, set upon by priests in the guise of the Titans, is slain and finally restored to life amidst great rejoicing. The Bacchic Mysteries were given every three years, and, like the Eleusinian Mysteries, were divided into two degrees. The initiates were crowned with myrtle and ivy, plants which were sacred to Bacchus. In the Anacalypsis, Godfrey Higgins conclusively establishes Bacchus as Dionysus as one of the early pagan forms of the Christos myth. The birthplace of Bacchus, called Sabazius or Sabaoth, was claimed by several places in Greece, 
but on Mount Zalmias, Mrs. in Thras, his worship seems to have been chiefly celebrated. He was born of a virgin on the 25th of December. He performed great miracles for the good of mankind, particularly one in which he changed water into wine. He rode in a procession, triumphal procession on an ass. He was put to death by the Titans and rose again from the dead on the 25th of March. He was always called the Savior. In his mysteries, he was shown to the people as an infant, as an infant is by the Christians on this day, on Christmas Day morning in Rome. While Apollo most generally represents the sun, Bacchus is also a form of solar energy, for his resurrection was accomplished with the assistance of Apollo. The resurrection of Bacchus signifies merely the extraction or disentanglement of the various parts of the Bacchic constitution from the titanic constitution of the world. Titanic. This is symbolized by the smoke or soot rising from the burned bodies of the titans. The soul is symbolized by smoke because it is extracted by the fire of the mysteries. Smoke signifies the ascension of the soul. Far evolution is the process of the soul rising, like smoke, from the divinely consumed material mass. At, at me time, the, the Bacchic rites were of a high order, but later they became much degraded. The Bacchanalia, or orgies of Bacchus, are famous in literature and caused quite a bit of uh, dismay at the current Olympic Games in 2024. The following paragraph from Porphyry gives a fairly adequate conception of the Lucinian symbolism. God being a luminous principle residing in the midst of the most subtle fire, he remains forever invisible to the eyes of those who do not elevate themselves above material life. On this account, the sight of transparent bodies such as crystal, Parisian, Parian marble, and even ivory recalls the idea of divine light. As the sight of gold excites an idea of its purity, for gold cannot be sullied. Some have thought by a black stone, some have thought by a black stone was signified the invisibility of the divine essence. To express supreme reason, the divinity was represented under the human form and beautiful, for God is the source of beauty of different ages and in various attitudes, sitting or upright, of one or the other sex, as a virgin or a young man, a husband or a bride, that all the shades and gradations might be marked. Everything luminous was subsequently attributed to the gods, the sphere and all that is spherical, to the universe, to the sun and moon, sometimes to fortune and to hope, the circle and all circular figures, to eternity, to the celestial movements, to the circles and zones of the heavens, the sections of the circles, to the phases of the moon, and pyramids and obelisks, to the igneous principle, and through that to the gods of heaven. A cone expresses the sun, a cylinder of the earth. The phallus and triangle, a symbol of the matrix, designate generation, from Essay on the Mysteries of Eleusius by M. Overoff. The Eleusinian mysteries, according to Hackathorn, survived all others and did not cease to exist as an institution until nearly 400 years after Christ, when they were finally superseded by Theodosius, style the Great, who cruelly destroyed all who did not accept the Christian faith. Of this, greatest of all philosophical institutions, Cicero said that it taught men not only how to live, but also how to die. The Orphic Mysteries Orpheus, the Thracian bard, the great initiator of the Greeks, ceased to be known as a man and was celebrated as a divinity several centuries before the Christian era. As to Orpheus himself, writes Thomas Taylor, scarcely a vestige of his life is to be found amongst the immense ruins of time. For who has ever been able to affirm anything with certainty of his origin, his age, his country, and condition? This alone may be depended on from general ascent, that there formerly lived a person named Orpheus, who was the founder of theology among the Greeks, the institutor of their lives and morals, the first of prophets and the prince of poets, himself the offspring of a muse, who taught the Greeks their sacred rites and mysteries, and from whose wisdom, as from a perennial and abundant fountain, the divine muse of Homer and the sublime theology of Pythagoras and Plato flowed. See the mystical hymns of Orpheus. 
Orpheus was the founder of the Grecian mythological system, which he used as the medium for promulgation of his philosophical doctrines. The origin of his philosophy is uncertain. He may have got it from the Brahmins, there being legends to the effect that he got it was a Hindu, his name possibly being derived from some Greek word meaning dark. Orpheus was initiated into the Egyptian mysteries, from which he secured extensive knowledge of magic, astrology, sorcery, and medicine. The mysteries of the Kabiri at Samothrace were also conferred upon him, and these, undoubtedly, contributed to his knowledge of medicine and music. The romance of Orpheus in Eurydice was, is one of the tragic episodes of Greek mythology, and apparently constitutes the outstanding feature of the Orphic Rite. Eurydice, in her attempt to escape from a villain seeking to seduce her, died from the venom of a poisonous serpent which stung her in the heel. Orpheus, penetrating to the very heart of the underworld, so charmed Pluto and Persephone with the beauty of his music that they agreed to permit Eurydice to return to life if Orpheus could lead her back to the sphere of living without once looking around to see if she were following. So great was his fear, however, that she would stray from him, that he turned his head and Eurydice, with a heartbreaking cry, was swept back to the land of death. Orpheus wandered the earth for a while, disconsolate, and there were several conflicting accounts of the manner of his death. Some declare that he was slain by a bolt of lightning, others that failing to save his beloved Eurydice, he committed suicide. The generally accepted version of his death, however, is that he was torn to pieces by a Siconian woman, whose advances he had spurned. In the tenth book of Plato's Republic, it is declared that, because of his sad fate at the hand of women, the soul that had once been Orpheus, upon being destined to live again in the physical world, chose rather to return in the body of a swan than be born of a woman. The head of Orpheus, after being torn from his body, was cast with his lyre into the river Hebrus, which down which it floated to the sea, where, wedging in a cleft of rock, it gave oracles for many years. The lyre, after being stole from his shrine and working the destruction of the thief, was picked up by the gods and fashioned into a constellation. If you are interested, I do have... Plato's Republic, we read it aloud. We did the same thing for it that we are doing here. So if you're interested, it is in the PickCast or the Ancient Lore playlist. I forget which one. Orpheus has long been sung as the patron of music. On his seven-string lyre, he played such perfect harmonies that the gods themselves were moved to acclaim his power. When he touched the strings of his instrument, the birds and beasts gathered about him, and he wandered through the forest and as he wandered through the forest, his enchanting melodies caused even the ancient trees with mighty effort to draw their gnarled roots from out of the earth and follow him. Orpheus is one of the many immortals who have sacrificed themselves that mankind might have the wisdom of the gods. By the symbolism of his music, he communicated the divine secrets to humanity, and several authors have declared that the gods, though loving him, feared that he would overthrow their kingdom, and therefore reluctantly encompassed his destruction. <clears throat> As time passed, the historical Orpheus became hopelessly confounded with the doctrine he represented, and eventually became the symbol of the Greek school of the ancient wisdom. Thus, Orpheus was declared to be the son of Apollo, the divine and perfect truth, and Calliope the muse of harmony and rhythm. In other words, Orpheus is the secret doctrine, Apollo, revealed through music, Calliope. Eurydice is humanity dead from the sting of the serpent of false knowledge and imprisoned in the underworld of ignorance. In this allegory, Orpheus signifies theology, which wins her from the king of the dead but fails to accomplish her resurrection because it falsely estimates and mistrusts the innate understanding within the human soul. The Siconian women who tore Orpheus limb from limb symbolize the various contending theological factions which destroy the body of truth. They cannot accomplish this, however, until their discordant cries drown out the harmony drawn by Orpheus from his magic lyre. The head of Orpheus signifies the esoteric doctrines of his cult. 
these doctrines continue to live and speak, even after his body, the cult, has been destroyed. The liar is the secret teachings of Orpheus. The seven strings are the seven divine truths, which are the keys to universal knowledge. I have those in a different playlist. The differing accounts of his death represent the various means used to destroy the secret teachings. Wisdom can die in many ways at the same time. The allegory of Orpheus incarnating in the white swan merely signifies that the spiritual truths he promulgated will continue and will be taught by the illumined initiates of all future ages. The swan is the symbol of the initiates of the mysteries. It is a symbol also of the divine power, which is the progenitor of the world. The Bacchic and Dionysic Rites The Bacchic Rites centers around the allegory of the youthful Bacchus, Dionysus or Zagreus, being torn to pieces by the Titans. These giants accomplished the destruction of Bacchus by causing him to become fascinated by his own image in a mirror. After dismembering him, the Titans first boiled the pieces in water and afterwards roasted them. Pallas rescued the heart of the murdered god and by this precaution, Bacchus, or Dionysus, was enabled to spring forth again in all his former glory. Jupiter, the Demiurges, beholding the crime of the Titans, hurled his thunderbolts and slew them, burning their bodies to ashes with heavenly fire. Out of the ashes of the Titans, which also contained a portion of the flesh of Bacchus, whose body they had partly devoured, the human race was created. Thus, the mundane life of every man was said to contain a portion of the Bacchic life. For this reason, the Greek mysteries warned against suicide. He who attempts to destroy himself raises his hand against the nature of Bacchus within him, since man's body is indirectly the tomb of this god and consequently must be preserved with the greatest care. Bacchus, Dionysus, represents the rational soul of the inferior world. He is the chief of the titans, <clears throat> the artificers of mundane spheres. The Pythagoreans called him the titanic monad. Thus, Bacchus is the all-inclusive idea of the titanic sphere and the titans, or gods of the fragments, the active agencies by means of which universal substance is fashioned into the pattern of this idea. <laughs> I just figured out where Brandon Sanderson got his uh, Cosmere from. The Bacchic state signifies the unity of the rational soul in a state of self-knowledge, and the titanic state the diversity of the rational soul which, being scattered throughout creation, loses the consciousness of its own essential oneness. The mirror into which Bacchus gazes and which is the cause of his fall is the great sea of illusion, the lower world fashioned by the titans. Bacchus, the mundane rational soul, seeing his image before him, accepts the image as a likeness of himself and ensouls the likeness. That is, the rational idea ensouls its reflection, the irrational universe. By insoling the irrational image, it implants in it the urge to become like its source, the rational image. Therefore, the ancients said that a man does not know the gods by logic or by reason, but rather by realizing the presence of the gods within himself. After Bacchus gazed into the mirror and followed his own reflection into matter, the rational soul of the world was broken up and distributed by the titans throughout the mundane sphere of which it is the essential nature but the heart, or source of it, they could not scatter. The Titans took the dismembered body of Bacchus and boiled it in water, symbol of immersion in the material universe, which represents the incorporation of the Bacchic principle in form. The pieces were afterward roasted to signify the subsequent ascension of the spiritual nature out of form. When Jupiter, the father of Bacchus and the Demiurgus of the universe, saw that the titans were hopelessly involved in the rational, involving the rational or divine idea by scattering its members through the constituent parts of the lower world, he slew the titans in order that the divine idea might not be entirely lost. From the ashes of the titans he formed mankind, whose purpose of existence was to preserve and eventually to release the Bacchic idea, or rational soul, from the titanic fabrication. 
Jupiter, being the demiurgist or fabricator of the material universe, is the third person of the creative triad, consequently the lord of death, for death exists only in the lower sphere of being over which he presides. Disintegration takes place so that reintegration may follow upon a higher level of form or intelligence. The thunderbolts of Jupiter are emblematic of his disintegrative power. They reveal the purpose of death, which is to rescue the rational soul from the devouring power of the irrational nature. Man is a composite creature his lower nature consisting of the fragments of the titans and his higher nature of the sacred, immortal flesh, life of Bacchus. Therefore, man is capable of either a titanic, irrational, or a Bacchic, rational existence. The titans of Hesiod, who were twelve in number, are probably innocuous to the celestial zodiac, whereas the titans who murdered and dismembered Bacchus represent the zodiacal powers distorted by their involvement in the material world. Thus, Bacchus represents the sun who is dismembered by the sons of the zodiac and from whose body the universe is formed. When the terrestrial forms were created from the various parts of this body, the sense of wholeness was lost and the sense of separateness established. The heart of Bacchus, which was saved by Pallas or Minerva, was lifted out of the four elements symbolized by his dismembered body and placed in the ether. The heart of Bacchus is in the immortal center of the rational soul. After the rational soul had been distributed throughout creation and the nature of man, the Bacchic mysteries were instituted for the purpose of disentangling it from the irrational titanic nature. This disentanglement was the process of lifting the soul out of the state of separateness into that of unity. The various parts and members of Bacchus were collected from the different corners of the earth, when all the rational parts are gathered, Bacchus is resurrected. The rites of Dionysus was very similar to those of Bacchus, and by many the two gods are considered as one. Statues of Dionysus were carried into the Eleusinian mysteries, especially the lesser degree. Bacchus, representing the soul of the mundane sphere, was capable of an infinite multiplicity of form and designations. Dionysus apparently, was his solar aspect. The Dionysiac architects constituted an ancient secret society in principles and doctrines much like the modern Freemasonic order. They were an organization of builders bound together by their secret knowledge of the relationship between the earthly and the divine sciences of architectonics. These were supposedly employed by King Solomon in the building of his temple, although they were not Jews, nor did they worship the god of the Jews, being followers of Bacchus and Dionysus. The Dionysiac architects erected many of the great monuments of antiquity. They possessed a secret language and system of marking their stones. They had annual convocations and sacred feasts. The exact nature of their doctrines is unknown. It is believed that Tyrum Abif was an initiate to the society. And so ends section three. And we got a little bit to chew on here, right? We got a couple of things from history to talk about. And again, there's not a whole lot for me to expand upon, right? This is historical records being condensed in his best effort, right? I, I agree that he was trying to do this in a good faith effort to increase the knowledge of man. There is not a whole lot here for me to dispute. Anything that I did dispute, I, I went ahead and said it. There's a lot of things here that actually agree with what I do, right? I believe in the Trinity, but it is not Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It is body, mind, and spirit, right? The Holy Spirit is a very real thing. I, I do not blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Uh, the Trinity is a very real thing. The oneness is a very real thing. That's another thing that I believe. I believe that God is and that we are all expressions of God. I believe that we are here voluntarily, that we have decided to come here for the experience that we are having, no matter whether it is a good one or a bad one, you decided to have it. Now, there are temptations that you are meant to, to resist, and there are temptations that you are, that other people are meant to resist. And so there's a very complicated set of theology that goes into that, but it all comes down to your sovereign choices as a sovereign 
piece of God. I believe that God is. He is me. He is you. He is the space between me and you, and he is the space between the space between me and you. He is everything you can touch and everything that you cannot touch. He is every single expression of anything ever in the entirety of the universe. It is all part of God and all part of the divine plan. I believe that there are very many branches of that plan that can play out depending upon your decisions and that God, the creator, has built in contingencies into each one of those plans and then you get to choose which direction your timeline is going that you are in control of the one that you are on other people are in control of their timelines and you don't get to affect those but you can affect yours through manifestation it is affected by prayer fasting and, me and meditation and manipulating the electromagnetic energies of creation i believe that those are possible and we will be going through those as we continue through this system Hopefully I brought a little bit of enlightenment, not too much confusion, and maybe just a little bit of levity to a series of somewhat complicated topics. This is, again, just history. There's not a whole lot here for me to expound upon. I wasn't there. I'm not some historic scholar, right? I am taking at faith that he did the research here. For the most part, it appears to be interpreted as correctly as you could expect. Right? I don't have the original source material, so I can't say whether or not things were translated correctly. I cannot say whether the intention of the words were there. I take that on faith. I take on faith that the things that resonate with me and the things that I am told to tell you are the things that I am supposed to so that you can do your ascension work too. I have already manifested healing in my life. It is not immediate. It is not right away. It is not even permanent in, in all cases, right? Once you are healed, does not mean something else can't go wrong. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be another sickness. It doesn't mean that because I healed this one thing that I might not die of another one. But for now, right now, I can talk to you in this tone of voice because God has allowed me to manifest that. His work through me has allowed me to talk to you in this tone of voice. And you may not know how big of a deal that is. But if you go back through my videos from two years ago, you'll see. It's a whole different world for me now. I am manifesting my voice. I am manifesting the blessings of the Spirit. I have such a happy life. You cannot even comprehend it. You can. Don't get me wrong. But you probably would disbelieve it if I just told it to you. The powers that God has imbued you with are very real. You can indeed manifest into your life. And we will absolutely be expounding upon that as we go forward to the crew well if you like what i'm doing here let me know down below give me a like share and a sub throw me a comment whether you agree or disagree if it remains respectful it gets to stay up if you really like what i'm doing hit me with that super thanks to the crew thanks for hanging out i appreciate every single minute that you are here with me and i am praying for you every single day until next time i love you God loves you. You are perfect, whole, and complete just the way that you are. And this has been Pitt's Take. Peace.